Hi, listeners. Welcome to the Grief Out Loud podcast produced by the Dougie Center for Grieving Children. I'm Janet Christofaro and wanted to give you just a little heads up as you listen to this episode, you'll be hearing references to our old name, which was Dear Ducky. So just so you don't get too confused, you're listening to the right podcast and we look forward to bringing you even more great content under the Grief Out Loud name. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Dear Dougie podcast, produced by the Dougie Center for Grieving Children in Portland, Oregon. I'm Jana DeCristofero. After over 30 years of listening to the stories of grieving children, teens, young adults, and adults in our grief support groups, we were looking for a way to share what we've learned from them with the larger community. This podcast is a way to open up the often avoided conversation about grief. While we all experience loss during our lives, when it occurs, most of us don't know what to do, how to feel, or how to talk about it. So whether you're grieving a loss or wanting to support someone who is, we're here to explore and talk about what matters to you most in grief. Today, episode 30, can't believe we just hit 30 episodes, I'm here with a guest, Stephanie. Welcome, Stephanie. Thanks, Jenna, for having me. Thanks for being here. And I asked Stephanie to join us today to talk about her story and talk about her experience with grief, particularly around the idea of experiencing two different deaths at the same time. Would you share a little bit about your story, Stephanie? Absolutely. On May 8th in 2014, I lost my husband and both my daughter, who was four at the time. Um, He took her life and then his own Up to that point, he had had a car accident the year prior. They had him on a lot of medications, and when they took him off the painkillers, he had bipolar, and we didn't know it, and he went into a manic episode and was hospitalized Mm -hmm. for that. And after the manic came depressed, it was several months after that, he took her life and then his own. Mm -hmm. And I came home to find them. And you also have another I have another daughter. daughter. Um, her name's Rafaela, and we call her Rafi. And luckily, she was not with me. You know, from an outsider who might just read about your story in the news or see it on TV, it could get easily labeled as just a murder-suicide that this has happened. But it seems like your story has a lot of different layers and complexities. When you think about those two deaths, how do you define them? It's challenging at times because... I understand in some respects why he took his own life. It's still hard for me to wrap around why he took hers. I kind of understand and it makes it very complex because it almost makes me have to separate out their deaths. I have to mourn them separately and it makes my feelings for him really complex. I love him and he was my best friend in the whole world and he took my daughter. That taints it. So you're grieving the loss of your husband, your best friend, the love that you shared, Mm -hmm. and then also having him as somebody who took the life of your daughter. And that speaks to a bigger picture, too, of all the different roles that you are playing in this, of a grieving wife, a grieving parent, and caregiving for, for Rafi, who's also grieving the loss of her sister and her stepdad. How does that all play out? It's exhausting. I have apparently a steel will. I continue to put one foot in front of the other and most times I just keep pledging along. I try not to hold too much back from Rafaela. If I'm having an emotional day we talk about it and saying mommy's having a hard time with daddy Bella stuff right now. So I we try to keep the conversation open so that I'm not like going in my room and crying. and keeping that from her. And keeping that from her because I think it's really healthy for her to see that it's okay. Mm-hmm. That this is an awful thing that happened and you can't just stuff that away. How does she respond when you come home and you say, you know, mommy's having a really hard time today? She has this little twinkle in her eye and this really soft smile that comes onto her face. It's the same smile when we look at a memory mm. or think about a memory and she often comes up and gives me a hug. If we're out and a memory hits me and I start getting teary-eyed, she'll come over and sit next to me and rub my back. Um, She's very compassionate and loving. So you're able to share in those moments together. It is very bonding for the Mm -hmm. two of us. Brings us closer and I'm hoping that it again teaches her that emotions are all valid 
and it's important to be able to, with safe people, be able to express them. And what does it look like when she's having a hard time or a hard day? How does she express that? Children grieve in different ways, partly because they don't always know necessarily what the behavior is from. Something little may set her off, and after listening to her and observing her, and I'm like, oh, that's grief. It's not something very related to the death, but it could be my Lego thing fell apart. As her mom, I can usually tune into that and just usually go up to her and hold her. Sometimes I'll prod her and say, I know it's really hard and I know you really miss them. And so you'll make that connection sometimes for her. Sometimes, and usually she will start sobbing and just kind of crumple in my arms. Just for you to acknowledge that and link that for her. Yeah. I know it. In our groups here, there's a lot of ice pack time, I call it. So there's kids who they bump their knee just barely on the foosball table and it's like cascading tears and I want an ice pack and I want to go sit in the kitchen with my favorite volunteer. And so oftentimes it's like a, an opportunity or an opening to create that care and that connection, but that the physical... You know, or somebody took the teddy bear they were playing with or something that from an adult perspective seems sort of minor can oftentimes be that opening. It seems like you see similar things with, with yeah. Rafi. Yeah, you know, and she's recently in school had a hard time with more anger and outbursts, and that's new, um, and continuing to talk with her teachers about it. Remind them because for them it's far out and they often have forgotten, like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. this happened to this kid, there's probably, a ri this is probably directly linked. And it's going in and reminding them of that sometimes. Helping keep that on their radar. And reminding her that you're gonna feel all kinds of different emotions and sadness and anger can be really strong and you know, communicating with the teacher saying, if she's experiencing them, please let her take a time out, mm -hmm. go to the bathroom, take some deep breaths, possibly talk to the school counselor. So Rafi's 11, um, puberty's right around the corner. Yeah, she is 11, and um, I'm already getting hints of tweenness, as they call it, a little bit more talk back. It can be really challenging because in my own exhaustion of the day-to-day -day things that I used to have help with, you know, with another parent, you know, just doing day-to-day -day house things and maintenance on the house and co-parenting, you're, you're on your own. I often don't have the energy to deal with the normal developmental pushback mm -hmm. of tweens and um, teen. It seems to take it out of a parent who isn't going through something life-altering and devastating as grief. It's like I hear a lot from just parents of teenagers the day-to-day, -day, like that's exhausting in and amongst itself. And then you have this added layer of, of the grief. That's exactly it. It's really challenging when you're in your own grief and having to step up. And oftentimes when she's having whatever emotion she's having, I have to almost put aside that grief and help her through that. And that's, and that's part of being a parent. But there are and have been times where I look to her and say, hey, Rafi, I can't do this. I don't have it in me. I need you to help me with X, Y, and Z. And I need you to have perspective on this thing that you think is catastrophic that isn't. The and Lego piece falling apart. <laughs> Exactly. You know, let's maybe have a little bit of a timeout and a breather. Part of me often has a lot of guilt around that because I want, I feel like I'm not a good enough parent to her. And I know that's not true. However, it's always there saying, you know, I told my friend before Christmas, I said, you know, she's already lost her daddy. She lost her sister. And that day she lost a lot of her mom. And that's not fair, and it is. It makes me put that one foot in front of the other and often do things that I don't necessarily want to do. But it's the motivation to get out of bed and do all the day-to-day day -day things. 
It is because I want her to look back on this time and say, my mom did the best she could mm -hmm. and she was supportive through the most awful possible thing that could ever happen to us. And that's my goal for her and us through this process. Here you are, like being here for your daughter, dealing with your own grief. What do you do that helps you have the energy and the presence to be there for her? Luckily, I'm in the alternative health field, and so I have a lot of knowledge already about the do's and don'ts. Mm. And I eat really well. I eat very balanced because I know that you can go with comfort food, but that kind of brings your energy down. And I know I need as much energy as I can have at mm -hmm. this point because you know, my energy is so low. I mean, grieving on a subconscious level just zaps you beyond zap. Um, I run a lot now. I usually run four days a week. Is that a new thing for you? It was a building up before this happened. I was about to run my first 10K when this happened. And um, I just finished my first half marathon. And I understand the importance of a lot of sleep and self-care and reaching out to friends and making sure to make time for them. Even when I want to, you know, if I want to isolate, I often will say, okay, no, go call your friend, mm -hmm. go have coffee. Don't get into the downward spiral that you're about to go down. Yeah, so interesting that you're noticing the urge to isolate is sometimes even the indicator to do the opposite, that you're really needing that time and support. Sometimes I need the time Sometimes I just need to cry and scream and shout and crumple on the floor in a ball of tears. And that time is important. And learning to be alone, because Rafi, when she goes with her dad every other weekend, my house is very mm. quiet and I'm not used to that. And learning to be okay with that silence. And at the same time, instead of just binge watching an entire series on Netflix, which is a really easy distraction, it's important to reach out to people who want to support you. What have you learned in that silence? How quiet quiet is. You know, half my family's gone. Even when Rafi went with her dad on her weekends, Jesse and Bella were there. Now they're not, and it is silent. Silence can sometimes be good and sometimes can be really challenging. Oftentimes that's when flashbacks start happening and those can be really challenging. Flashbacks to what I found that day. And um, yeah, your, your brain is an interesting thing. It can in some ways try to protect you and in some ways bring back these flashbacks when you least expect it, when you're washing a dish. Right, it often seems to be doing something that's totally disconnected from it. Yeah. It, it's something that so many people struggle with, the images of whether it was a violent death or a suicide or even the last image of seeing somebody in a hospital bed. If they've died from a long-term illness and people have various ways to cope with those images. Is there anything you've found that seems to work well for you? Sometimes I'll go for a run or I'll take the dog for a walk. Um, it depends where I'm at. If it's at home, I have a list of, you know, 500 projects that are constantly needing to be done, and I'll try and distract myself. Mostly it's distraction. You know, wash, go wash the dishes, go do a load of laundry, watch a show, read a book, read a magazine, listen to a podcast. Just try and get my brain out of the driving that it wants to do. Mm -hmm. Give it something else to focus on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Much like you do with kids when they're doing something that you don't want them to do, you say, oh, look at the pink fluffy unicorn. Right, shiny thing over here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. One thing I know a lot of people have talked about when they experience a murder or murder-suicide like you you experienced is how public the death can become and almost become something that the entire community is aware of. And I'm curious how that has played out for you. It was interesting at the beginning. If you read some of the articles, I was really grateful for all the people who spoke up of what a great dad Jesse was because the news, of course, wants to sensationalize everything. And I mean, the reality is he shot her and then shot himself and they didn't know him. And of course, they're going to assume the worst out mm -hmm. of him. 
and that wasn't who he was. And many of the neighbors spoke out and in the news and said, oh, he was always out playing with his kids. And several of our friends have even said to me, it was, Jesse was the dad that I wanted to be, you know? He was just an amazing dad. I was very grateful for that aspect because the news can sensationalize things in such a negative way. And when they don't have all the facts, I mean, that's easy. I didn't read any of the comments sections on any of those articles, mm -hmm. which I think really helped me. Always a recommendation for no matter what the type of article is out there, skip the comments. Skip the comments because it's much like Facebook. There's always gonna be haters mm -hmm. and that wasn't gonna be in my best interest. I last summer asked um, my mother-in-law to Google me because I was curious what came up and she said, well, your business came up first. <laughs> That's the good news. <laughs> You know, and second, third, and fourth is, you know, these articles and things like that. And that's challenging, you know, because if somebody, again, doesn't know me who, for me, they're going to know me by, oh, that's the woman whose husband killed their kid and then himself. Right. You get typecast into this idea that they will fill in the blanks of what that must mean by not knowing you personally or Jesse or Bella. Exactly. You know, it's one act, not a whole person. Mm -hmm. And um, that can be challenging, and I can't control that, so I try not to even go there. Mm -hmm. I can't control what other people think of me. Um, I can't control any of that. Mm -hmm. So, Stephanie, we, were, we just happened to be talking before we started recording today that today, on January 8th, we're recording exactly one year and eight months to the day since the death occurred. And over the course of that one year and eight months, what would you say has been the most surprising to you about this whole process? I think there's several things that have surprised me. Um, how much people wanna help after something like this and the flood of support and love towards Rafi and I and our healing process. It has been astonishing and humbling and I think maybe the second thing is the depth of this grief um, is bottomless and it's surprising. I often tell moms and parents to be when they're you know, pregnant and during that time, and I tell them it's really easy to imagine that you're gonna love more than you've ever loved this new child. What you also don't know is that you're going to be more mad than you've ever been in your whole entire life. The, the depth of the emotions are just vast, but what you don't sign up for is that depth of grief. And I wouldn't wish this on anybody else. It's, it really, I often tell people, I, I sort of wrap my head around the grief around Jesse. That's, it's a lot more tangible and Bella's grief is in an iron vault. Mm. There's a reason for that, because every time it opens that door an inch, I fall apart. It's almost like you can't handle it. And Absolutely overwhelming, all-consuming. It is, and part of it is the nature and how she died, because of the violent nature and how she died, because it was from the person who I trusted most to care for her. He was a stay-at-home dad. I mean, he was... He was the one in the day-to-day -day with the kids. And, you know, so there's so many layers to that grief. That's been surprising and not surprising. I mean, if you actually start to think about it, it's not very surprising. But when you're in it, it's, it's very surprising. The depth of that grief and how all-encompassing it can be. It's challenging. When you, when you really are in it to keep perspective, and that's the important times to reach out because it's very challenging mm -hmm. to keep your head above water when you're in that. And the, the reaching out to people, and, and as you mentioned, all of the things that you do to care for your physical body, so important to create a little bit of a foundation to step onto. Absolutely. It's, I think, movement and the exercise, I mean, they, it's one of the most natural endorphins that you can give your body. Mm -hmm. And community, and, and leaning on that community, and saying, hey, I'm having a really crappy day can we please go see a movie or? In a sense, taking people up on that, let me know if there's anything I can do, which can be 
so wonderful to have that offer of support, but also it can be sort of vague and, and difficult when you're grieving to be like, okay, thanks, but I don't actually know what I need. And then when I finally realize what I need, it's usually two in the morning, and can I really reach out to you then? But to, to go ahead and take people up on that. Absolutely. And reminding them to reach out to you is an important thing because sometimes when you're in that down place, you get into a head trip that, oh, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of in a down place. I don't want to bring somebody else down Mm -hmm. because now it's been over a year and a half. And whereas that's not in their most forefront mind, it's still in my most forefront mind. And I don't want to ruin somebody's day. And that's really the last thing they think of when you reach out. Mm -hmm. And my friends luckily usually know when I am quiet, because I'm usually not. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wait, Steph's quiet. Maybe we should text her. Mm -hmm. And that's really helpful. So such a great reminder of how important of no matter how much time has passed or how somebody may seem that they're doing really well or they're going to work and they're functioning, that it's so vital to keep reaching out to people and offering that support. It is. You have, I mean, I have to keep putting one foot in the front of the other. Um, I was actually asked today, do you ever have those days where you wake up and all you want to do is like stay in bed and hibernate all day? And I laughed because that's every day. (laughs) That's all I want to do. And, you know, I have to get up, we have to take care of the dog, I have to get Rafi to school, I have to come home, I run, I go to work, I get home, we make dinner, we walk the dog, you know, do homework, and then collapse in bed and deal with things that come up. So, yeah, I'm very functional to the outside world, but what goes on in my head and my heart are the same Mm -hmm. as they have been for the last year and eight months. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for coming today and talking about your story and sharing some really helpful suggestions for other people who might be going through something similar. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to talk with you today. And thanks, everyone out there, for tuning in and listening to Episode 30 of the Dear Dougie podcast. If you'd like to learn more about the Dougie Center, you can find us at www.dougy.org. You can also find past episodes there, or you can look us up in iTunes, where we would love if you gave us a rating, gave us a review. It helps other people find our podcast more easily. If you have any ideas of topics or things you'd like to hear us talk about on this podcast, please send them our way at help at Dougie.org, and we hope you'll join us again next time. Thanks for listening.